Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 26. We're going to be in the Old Testament uh, uh, for, for the rest of the year. Obviously, I'll have New Testament verses as well. But we are starting a new series today, uh, and we're going to begin in Second Chronicles chapter 26. We're starting a new series called Kings. Kings. It's called Kings Lessons from Their Legacy. So this new series is going to be a study of some of the Old Testament kings and lessons that we can learn from their lives and their legacy. How many of you know a legacy can both be good and bad? Not all legacies are good. A lot of times we talk about, we want to talk about the Good, like, great legacies like Brother Francis and Ms. Bad, right? As he's, as this, you know, hearing last week with, 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 uh, Eric True that Brother Francis was the first one to write him a check, right? From the church to move him here at first monthly support. And so what a blessing. I thought about that this morning as I was thinking about these numbers that you gave that here we are all these years later and we're still financially supporting Brother Eric. We're still in relationship. As I told you, I'm honored to serve on the board now, Ikai Alpha. And so what a great legacy. Come on, let's give it up for Ms. Babs and Brother Francis. What a great legacy that they, and that he, now that he's in heaven, has left. And Pastor Todd, and of course, he's still here, you know, serving in the ministry, serving globally. Uh, but, but we want to learn in these next quite a few weeks. Like I said, this will take us up to the Christmas service uh, in December. Uh, actually, I thought that's what that was. I was like, then and now, I was like, what was that? That's a, it's a Christmas promo? He's like, no, nah, just watch. I didn't know what, I had no idea what that was, you know. And so, um, so we're going to learn both good and bad, right? Lessons from their legacies, both good and bad. So we're going to start this series by learning a valuable lesson from King Uzziah. Second Chronicles 26, let's read verses 3 through 5. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 52 years. Come on, how many of you teenagers would be like, man, to be a king at 16 years old over a whole nation? His mother was, <laughs> some, some parents like, come on, pastor, they, they need to clean that room first, right? We could talk about being a king. His mother was Jacola from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Who there's so much just right there? Just right there. As long as he sought guidance from the Lord, the Lord gave him success. And he was very successful. King Uzziah was the 10th king in the line of Judah. He reigned over Judah. He was one of the most successful kings of that time. After Solomon and, and David and these guys, Uzziah was one of the most successful kings. And as you read, if you want to, to continue to study for time's sake, but if you read, I'm not going to read them all, from 6 to 15, you'll see Uzziah's extraordinary success in military, not only victories, but but he was creating uh, different weapons and structures and whatnot. Uh, it was modern day warfare, just very innovative in his ability. Uh, to create things like this, uh, uh, to win military victories, architecture, how they were building things in forts, and also agriculture as well. So he was very successful. And it says that, and then it, if you want to do a study, continue to read uh, those verses. And I encourage you to read the whole chapter in his, about his life. But let's pick up in verse 16 now. It says, but when he became powerful, he also became proud. Uh-oh which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord as God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. <clears throat> Azariah, the high priest, went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men. I love that. They confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron, who are set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned. The Lord will not honor you for this. Uzziah, who was holding the incense burner, became furious. But as he was standing there, raging against the priest before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the high priest, and all the other priests saw the leprosy, they rushed him out. And the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. <clears throat> so King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house, for he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. His son Jotham was part, was put, I'm sorry, in charge of the royal palace and he governed the people of the land. See, most sin in our life 
not all, but most sin in our life is pretty easy to see. Right? I mean, we, we recognize a lot of, of the different things that, that, that we do that come out out, outwardly, but pride, pride is almost impossible to see ourselves. Most people don't just walk around acknowledging I'm a pretty prideful person. It's usually the opposite. When we're prideful, we don't think we are. We think we got it all together. Think about it this way. And some of you have dealt with this, and if you have, I, I, I feel for you. Think about a house that has termites in it. Most people, I mean, you can get, when it gets really bad, you can see some visible evidence of termites. But a lot of people find out that they have termites in their house, and that their house is literally rotten, usually whenever they're selling their home and they're getting an inspection, or maybe they do some type of renovation or something, right? They start ripping out sheetrock and start looking to change things. Maybe you're changing the roof and the roofing deck. And a lot of times that's when you find that there's termite damage and the house is literally rotting from the inside out. Are y'all tracking with me? But it's hard to see. It usually just doesn't appear until it gets really, really bad. So today the lesson that we will learn from King Uzziah to start this series is the pitfalls of pride. The pitfalls of pride. And we will see a few of them in this story. Let's start out with number one, that pride is cunning. Pride is cunning, right? The word cunning means to, to accomplish something in a deceitful way is one of the definitions. Uzziah started off by seeking and fearing the Lord. Remember that. So, so like us, I'm, I'm talking to the church here and, and maybe, and, and others too. And I'm going to talk to you later. Maybe if you're not a born again believer, but, but we all start out good usually we get born again right and 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 we're seeking the lord and we're doing well so this tells me these first few verses let's read it again that we are all prone to this because this was a man of god it says that in verses three through five that he was 16 when he took over he became king he reigned for 52 years and he was pleasing in the lord's sight just as his father Amazia had done and uzziah sought the lord during the days of zachariah who taught them who taught him to fear the lord so he started out by seeking the Lord, right? He didn't just come out. Now we'll see if you read this. There's so many kings in the Old Testament. Some of these kings right out the gate, the Bible says they were evil men. They were wicked. They didn't serve the Lord, right? Right out the gate. You see this. But this was a brother that, that actually was seeking the Lord. He had, he had a spiritual father or a natural father, right? That, 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 that taught him the ways of the Lord. See, pride creeps in like a burglar at night when someone's sleeping. It's, 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 it creeps in. It, it comes in in the, the back door or window when, 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 when even you're seeking the Lord, right? It slowly grows in our hearts through time. See, I mentioned this earlier. A lot of sins are, 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 are noticeable. If you have anger, it's pretty, pretty easy to see that, right? Cause you yell at people, right? Y'all laughing because it's true, right? Or if you, if you covet or you lust, that's, I mean, that's pretty obvious because you know you're desiring something or someone that doesn't belong to you. See, pride can wear all types of masks to where you can't see it. You know, pride can wear, and in this context, a godly man, a king of Judah, seeking the Lord, pride could even wear a religious mask. I'm holier than they are. I read more than them. I pray more than them. I fast more. It could wear an educational mask. I'm up in the upper echelon of society because I have more degrees than these people. And here's the tricky one. It could even wear a humble mask. When you start thinking, I'm more humble than that person, that's a contradictory statement right there. I'm more humble than them. Right? You ever read that? And, and or Moses writes, I think it's in, it's in Exodus, or it might have been in Genesis, he wrote the Torah, that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. You think, man, that brother wrote that. Like, is that like, like you know? No, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, we know. So, see, one of the main causes of pride, and we see it here, can be success. The very thing that the Lord blesses us with, so I said, I just, I didn't, I didn't, I was just felt led to pray along those lines, so I said I'd mention it. It can be success. Verse 5 says, as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. But then you drop down to verse 16, it says, but when he became powerful, so he was successful and powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. Sometimes the very thing like success is a big, source of pride. 
See, pride also comes from Satan because he not only wants to take you down, right? The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, according to Jesus in John 10, 10. But you know what? If the enemy can't trip you up and take you down with some other sin, he'll puff you up. The enemy will puff you up and, and whisper how awesome you are and how good you are and all these things. And I'm going to show you it's not just all of that to try to bring you down, right? Think about it. Pride was Satan himself's downfall. Isaiah records this in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. How have you been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world? For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heaven and be like the most high. And we'll see later. I'm going to just reference it. I'll say it here. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning, right? He was prideful. He wanted to be like God, above God. And that was his main downfall. See, pride progresses steadily. Warping our self-image and making us think that we're above others. And that's what I'm going to get into. This was leads to my next point. Talking about the enemy, you can have success, you can do all that, and that's great. Nothing wrong with success, the blessings, all of that stuff. But which leads to point two, pride is fueled by comparison. Even Satan said, I will be like the Most High. He told Adam and Eve, no, you're not going to die. You're going to just be like God if you eat that fruit. Right? Pride is fueled by comparison. Pride is all about perspective. It's in the way you think about yourself in comparison to people and life itself. It's how you view yourself in comparison to people, power, prosperity, and parameters. One word that could describe pride is above. I feel like I'm above all of that. I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of amens today. It's all good. It's all good. Do you ever think, man, I'm above the rules? Do you ever think like, okay, y'all saying no, but how, I mean, come on, how many of y'all follow the speed limit every single time you drive? Well, thank you. There's a couple people. Good. Some of y'all like, brother, I go under the speed limit, right? I need to confess my sin right now on that issue, right? My kids are telling me, dad, are you going 35? And I jokingly say, baby, that's just a suggestion. That's just, no, it's not. Look, I'm confessing. I'm preaching to myself today, right? No, sometimes I really don't notice, but right? But that's pride. Nah, man, that's, I, that's, I can't go faster than 35, man. Ain't nobody around. You know, I'm good, right? Come on, how many of you justify stuff like Let's just talk about right there. I'm confessing my sin. Come on, all right. Thank y'all for helping me. Thank y'all. I know some of y'all bless the Lord for those that go to speed limit. That's awesome. We need to. We need to strive for that. Help us, Holy Ghost. See, in this, Uzziah thought he was above the rules and that the rules didn't apply to him. Right? Let's read it again, verses 16 to 18. But when he became powerful, he became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the altar. That wasn't his job. It shows it here. It was That's only for the priests. Azariah the high priest went in after him. With 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men, they confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. This is the work of the priest alone. God had said that as a parameter, as a rule, right? This work, burning incense, these things are for the priests, not kings. The descendants of Aaron who are set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary for you have sinned and the Lord will not honor you for this. See, he must have thought, I'm the king, and I've been successful, as we just mentioned, and you could read. I've been successful in everything else, so guess what? I can go in and burn incense. I'm the king. I'm the man. Who's going to stop me? Well, 80 priests stopped you, 81 of them, actually, and then the Lord himself. See, sometimes when we're successful, and, and, and especially in positions, uh, you know, uh, of authority, we think we're above the rules. He thought the priests were not only where he's above, he thought the priests were beneath him. Second Chronicles 26, 19, Uzziah, who was holding the incense burner, became furious. But as he was standing there raging at the priest before the incense altar of the Lord's temple, I'm going to stop right there. He was furious and started raging at them. See, Uzziah thought he was above the priests and treated them like insufficient. He treated them with contempt. Man, you don't can't tell me what to do. I'm the king. Everything I've put my hands to has been says, oh, don't come tell me what to do. And in anger, he raged at them. 
When I read that word rage, you know what I thought of? Road rage. Stop and think about it. The root of road rage is pride. You cut somebody off. You're not going. You honk at them. It's you're invading my space here. How dare you cut me off? How dare you honk the horn at me? Think about it. The root of road rage is pride. I can't believe you would cut me off or do this or whatever, right? It's pride. A lot of that stuff. It's how dare you come to me, honk at me or whatever, right? You're in my space, my personal space. See, the greatest way to detect pride is the way that you view others. And I'm about to get into not as much as you view yourself, and that's part of it, but how you view others and how you act when you're driving. Now, I have failed multiple occasions in this area as well. Can I get a witness? Anybody else is with me? Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It ain't just me. My wife's sitting there, and she's holding her tongue like, yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've, I've definitely... I've apologized. I've, I've wanted to. I literally wanted to go try to find somebody and apologize to him before. I remember Pastor Ty telling a story years ago that he he put in a parking spot and somebody was going in that spot he didn't know and they flicked them off, and he was like, "Wow!" And he tells that story as an illustration one Sunday, and then somebody walks up to him after, was like, "Pastor, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was you. It was somebody in the church, <laughs> right? True story, right? True story. Be for, be careful who you tell number day number one." It might be your pastor. That's a, that's a lesson for you right there, right? That's a, that's, ooh. Hey, so how do you compare yourself to others? I'm going to have a few quotes from some of you have read C.S. Lewis' book, Mere Christianity. And he has a whole chapter on pride. He says this, pride gets no pleasure in having something only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They are proud of being richer or more clever or better looking than others. If someone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. It's not about having things. It's whenever you start thinking, I have more than that person. I'm better than that person. I'm smarter than that person, right? I drive better. I look better. Whatever the case is. Some people, so you might think you're above the rules, you're above people. Some people even think they're above God. You know how I know that? Because when people treat God's word and commandments as suggestions instead of commandments, they think they're above God. They think they know better than God. Yeah, I know the Bible says that, but that's pride. I know the Bible says that, but... God knows my heart. Yeah, and he says it's deceitfully wicked, by the way. So stop using that. You think your thoughts are better? Morality is better? I'm going to give you another example. When people know, if you know, if you in here today listening, that Jesus says he is the only way to heaven, yet you convince yourself there's multiple ways to heaven, you put yourself above God. And more and more people are doing that today. More and more people out there are saying it, doing it. Sadly, even some churches, some leaders are saying, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If anybody teaches there's any other way, they're putting themselves above God. They're saying, no, I know better. Jesus died. And it's crazy. What blows my mind is that people will agree that Jesus came, he died on the cross and all this stuff, but they don't agree with the whole part of the gospel. So that tells you you think that you're better than God. You agree with part of his plan of salvation, but not all of it. So that puts you in a place above God. Are y'all with me this morning? And that kind of thinking has consequences. Some in this life and some that will last for all eternity. Which leads to number three. Pride has consequences. Pride has consequences. I'm getting hot preaching this message. I'm like, man, I'm getting convicted as I'm preaching. Pride produces actions. It makes us act, but it also causes God to act. 
See, the consequences of pride can be swift. Let's go back to our, our text, Second Chronicles 26. Let's read 19 and 21 again. But as he was standing there raging at the priest before the entrance altar of the Lord's temple, that's where we stopped earlier, leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the high priest, and all the other priests saw the leprosy, they rushed him out. I love this. And the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. He was raging at the priest, and when he saw the hand of the Lord touch him, he's like, all right, all right, I'm out. Let's go. Let's." He was ready to run out. Which let me just stop and say, I love how the Lord gives us warnings first. I didn't have this in my notes. I just believe it's the Holy Ghost. I love how merciful the Lord is. The Lord gave him a warning, tried to get him out of there first. You notice he didn't get leprosy right away. I think if he would have heeded spiritual authority and brothers and fathers around him and would have left, he might have been good. But he didn't heed the warning of the Lord. He stood his ground in pride and started raging at the priest. How dare you? And then the Lord struck him with a consequence. I just saw that. God's so merciful to us. Amen? There is consequences, but even in our mess up and our consequences, the Lord, he sends us warnings first. Aren't y'all thankful for that? I know I am. Even if I just, I just say that, I'm just so thankful. Thank you, Lord. So King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house where he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. Again, there was it was swift. But there was a warning first. I just referenced it. Jesus said we see warnings all through the Bible and even in, up until history and modern day that I thought of a couple of. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning, right? We, we saw Isaiah prophesied about that. Jesus says the same thing because of his pride. King Nebuchadnezzar bragged about building Babylon in the Old Testament till a voice from heaven said, for seven years you will eat grass like a cow. And sure enough, Nebuchadnezzar went insane, was in the fields, hair grew long, fingers as, as long as talons, and he ate grass until he got his mind right and he repented and humbled himself. Now, this is interesting. Pastor Kelly brought this up to me. I looked it up a little bit the other day. Think about Saddam Hussein. Some of you are younger. You have to Google who Saddam Hussein is. For those of us my age and older, right, we remember Saddam Hussein, who's the leader of Iraq for years. And you know, you've heard it when Fabian's here, Iraq is modern day Babylon. Saddam Hussein said he was the predecessor or the successor to Nebuchadnezzar. And if you go look it up, you'll see that he was not only building palaces for himself, but he was building uh, uh, palaces and different statues and things like that that would replicate the things of Nebuchadnezzar's day. Basically saying, I'm the second Nebuchadnezzar. All these things. He had palaces, uh, Fabian told us this, all over Iraq. People are starving and dying, and he had palaces all over Iraq. They would literally cook lunch every day at different palaces all over the country just in case he might show up. And if he wouldn't show up, they would throw the food out. And there was people starving all over his nation. Of course, you know, there was a whole people, a genocide where he killed a bunch of people. Do you remember the images of Saddam Hussein when they caught him? He was in a, in, in a, in a, a hole in the ground, in dirt, long hair, scraggly beard. Eventually, there's going to be consequences for those that pride, right? You look in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, King Herod Agrippa, he spoke, he was spoken, he was, he was an orator, he was talking to a delegation of people, and after he spoke, he said, they said, oh man, this is the voice of a God instead of a man, and he received that praise with pride, then the angel of the Lord struck him with worms, it says, and he died. I don't know what all that's about either. I don't want to know. It sounds pretty painful, right? That pride, he said, yeah, I, I am, that that's, that sounds about right. I'm a God, not a man. And the, the Lord struck him immediately. See, God actively resists the proud. We know James 4, 6 says, as the scripture says, which is quoting, right? The Old Testament, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One of the things the Lord opposes, right? We in the thick of football season and you see you have an opponent who opposes you when you get on the field. They're trying to do everything exact opposite of what you're trying to do when you line up on that football field or basketball, baseball, whatever it is. Think about that visual. When you're prideful, God's on the other side of the line opposing you. Amen? Uzziah not only dealt with physical consequences, but relational and social ones as well. Pride, it says, isolated Uzziah from the temple and his community, right? It said he was isolated, couldn't go in the temple anymore. And the whole, he lived as a leper, right? Uh, Pastor Eric talked about it last, uh, last week about leprosy, right? The lepers, uh, 
And he was one of those. He goes from a king to being a leopard in a leopard colony. See, in essence, God still had mercy on Uzziah, even though, like I said, he had a, a, a warning. He still had mercy. Because remember, up until this point, the Bible says that he was pleasing to the Lord and he sought the Lord up until this point in his life. See, leprosy is a slow death. So I believe God wanted to give Uzziah time to repent and humble himself. And the Bible doesn't tell us if he does. It just said he died as a leper. But I'm just hoping that he did. I'm hoping as he was, he was exiled that he humbled himself. And I go back to even one more uh, in that, in the social and relational. And y'all seen it. I'm not going to say no names or nothing. But look at all these celebrities and stars that have been doing super perverted things for 20, 30 years. And they've been, they, what they thought on top of the world, multimillionaires, living in what they're doing, abusing people, treating people harshly. Now they're sitting behind prison walls or in jails. Be sure your sin will find you out and they will be consequences for pride. Now, hopefully we can learn this lesson today in the days ahead and not have such a tragic downfall like Uzziah or some of these people that we're talking about. In this life lesson, God wants to give us a perspective of what pride does. It rots away our very being if we don't repent and humble ourselves. Amen? So the fourth and final thing is good news is that pride has a cure. Amen? Right? It's cunning. It's fueled by comparison. Uh, it, it's, it's, what's my third point? I just said it has consequences. But it also has a cure. A lot of us are familiar with the next scripture I'm about to read. We sing worship songs based on it. But look at this verse in the context and even the historical point and timeline that this was written in Isaiah 6. Look at Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 7. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. We just read about his life, highlights and lowlights of his life. He died from leprosy. Because he was proud, and Isaiah said it was the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces because they didn't want to look at the Lord. Two, they covered their feet, and the other two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's army. The whole earth, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed, for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a filthy pe a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's army. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and with a burning coal he had taken from the altar, and with a pair of tongs, he touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now... Your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. There's a two-part cure for pride. One, look upon the high and holy one. Keep your eyes focused on the king of kings. Because you see, when we keep our eyes focused on him, we realize our state that we're really in. No matter how successful we are, how blessed we are, how, how smart we are, degrees, all of this kind of stuff, when you look upon the king of kings, it humbles you. It's perspective, right? Take notice of yourself in light of the great and high and holy one whose train fills the temple. Where, where even seraphim, angels, supernatural be be beings cover their eyes with their wings because they don't want to look upon how glorious the Lord is, how powerful he is. Think about that. Go back to C.S. Lewis. He said this. This is so powerful. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. I'm going to just stop right there. And we're going we're gonna to get into that a little more in just a second. As long as you're proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. Watch this. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see anything above you. Isn't that so good? As long as we're looking down on people, it means we're not looking up at our master. You can't do both. You can't be prideful in looking at people and be worshipful in looking up to the heaven and God on his throne. So one, we got to recognize and look to the high and holy one, realize our state. Next, I mentioned it earlier. Actually, I didn't continue on. You have to humble yourself. James 4, 6, let's read 4, 6, and 7. God opposes the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. So what's the solution? Humble yourself before God. See, we, we talked about the consequences of Uzziah, Nebuchadnezzar, Saddam Hussein, local, I mean, recent or current, all these, these people, superstars and all that, that have been greatly humbled. The Lord gives us a chance to humble ourselves. That's the good news, guys. All right, this is the good part of the message. This is the good news of the message. You should be encouraged by this. If you're sitting here today, you got a chance. If you've been walking around in pride, and by the way, let me just stop and say this. We all deal with pride. Amen? We all deal with pride. I remember hearing, not specifically about pride, but I remember almost on his deathbed, close to the end of his life, they asked Billy Graham, how, how, what did he learn after all these years walking with the Lord, preaching, winning millions of souls to the Lord? He said, the longer I live, the longer I, re- the more I realize how much I need Jesus. The more I realize how much I need him. Here's a great man of God, did all this amazing things and he realized, you know what? And I'm sure he still since, right? You get on a stage like that, pride and stuff like that. We can humble ourselves. Amen. It tells us that's a, that's the cure. That's the antidote, the prescription, however you want to say it, to pride is humbling ourselves. One, it's looking upon the Lord, seeing him for who he is, and in humbling ourselves. One more C.S. Lewis quote. You probably heard this is a pretty popular one. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. In other words, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. We're not just like lowly worms. We are, we are children of the most high God. Amen? I'm going to say it this way. You are valuable. We are valuable, but we're not superior. Let me say that again. We're valuable, but we're not superior. We're very valuable. Jesus died on the cross for you and I. He causes his sons and daughters. We've been adopted in. We have a great inheritance, right, on earth and for eternity. So it's not thinking less of yourself. I'm just a lowly worm. and I, You know, it's not that. It's just thinking of yourself less. Right? It's putting your focus on him and helping and serving and reaching out to others instead of comparing yourself to others. So ultimately, these two far, two part, two-fold cure, and the worship team is going to come out and help us with this last part. Ultimately, worship is the cure for pride. Why? Because true worship is seeing and expressing to God who he really is, and we have to humble ourselves to truly worship. we got to be humble and realize, Lord, I love you, I need you, I, I worship you. I didn't, I just, I, I put him on the spot of asking Nate just a while ago. I was like, was we were doing Alpha and Omega? I thought, man, I wasn't planning, but what a great way to end this message. But before we, we go back and we are going to worship, I said it earlier. C.S. Lewis said it, but the Bible says it. Jesus said it. You can't know God if you're prideful. You must first humble yourself in repentance. Some of you are familiar with this parable that Jesus taught. But it's found in Luke 18, 9 through 14. Then Jesus told this story to some who had confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everybody else. Does that sound like pride to you? That sounds like a good definition of pride, right? Great confidence in their own righteousness and they scorned everybody else. They compared themselves. They looked down on others. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. I love some translations that he prayed to himself because that's pretty much what he was doing. I thank you I'm like not like everyone else. I don't cheat. I don't sin. I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly like, like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance. Dare not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. I just saw this. Just like the seraphim wouldn't even lift their eyes. This tax collector got it. He was so humble, he wouldn't even lift his eyes. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, this is Jesus speaking, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves in pride will be humble, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray about pride and we're going to hopefully worship our way out of this thing. It's just the beginning. It's not a one-time thing. But, but first and foremost, you can't know God if you're prideful. 
You can't get to heaven if you're prideful because you're depending on yourself, your own thoughts, your own works, what you've done, what you're doing. You have to humble yourself. This tax collector, despised tax collector, beat his chest in humility, not even looking up, said, Lord, I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. How do you be saved? Say what the tax collector said. Lord, I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. If you say, Brandon, I'm not sure where I would spend eternity. Again, tomorrow, another funeral, Pastor Dixon and I will be attending. They believe and know that her, their, their mom and sister's in heaven. What about you? If it was your funeral tomorrow, where would you be at in eternity? Could you say in faith with confidence, not confidence in yourself, but Brandon, I know when I die, I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord because I've repented of my sins. If you say, Brandon, I'm not sure, man. I thought there was multiple ways to heaven. I thought coming to church and giving a little money and doing that stuff would help, but I'm not sure. I need to get right. I want to be born again today. If that's you and you want to identify with that task collector and say, man, I, I need mercy because I'm a sinner and I want to be forgiven. Lift up your hands. Say, that's me. That's me. I see your hands. Anybody else? I see you. I see your hands going up. Even if you watch it online, I see hands going up all over the building. Anybody else? Have you said, man, I've walked away from the Lord. Man, I, I once was serving the Lord and I got off track. I need to resurrender my life to Christ. If that's you, lift up your hands. Say, I've been prideful, man. And I, I went away thinking I could do it on my own. But now I need Jesus. I see your hand, ma'am. Different hands going up. Come on, let's pray. Even based upon what this tax collector said, Jesus gave this parable. Can we all pray together? Lord Jesus, have mercy on me this morning. I know that I've sinned. I repent of my sins. But I know you died and shed your blood to save me. Would you save me this morning, Lord? Cleanse me. Help me to walk humbly with you and with other people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate with those this morning that made that decision. Hey, if you made that decision, fill out the connection card in the chair in front of you, bring it to the info center. If you're watching online, there's that connection card link. Hey, before you leave, why don't you stand up with me? And let's all, look, I'm convicted. Like I said, we all deal with pride, all of us. Can we repent and then we're gonna worship? As I said, it's, it's repenting and humbling yourself and then looking on the one, our creator. Can we, can we ask the Lord to help us? Lord, I repent personally right now. I'm going to pray y'all can listen in, but I encourage you to pray with me. Lord, I'm sorry for pride. Lord, I know there's pride in my life. I know that I've thought about and said things and done things that were prideful. And Lord, I'm not just saying that because I'm in front of church. You heard me say it this morning by myself in my living room. Would you forgive me for pride, Lord? But you have mercy on me. I'm sorry, Lord. I humble myself before you today and ask that you would help me. I pray, Lord, as we come together and we all repent as a, as a body of Christ. We know this is something we'll battle off and on all of our life between successes that you've blessed us with, the enemy coming against us. But help us to walk humbly with you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we worship, we focus on you. Just as Isaiah said, seeing you high and lifted up. You are Alpha and Omega, and we worship you. Come on, church. Let's worship one more time before we go together. Come on, let's humble ourselves. Come on, give him your worship. Give him your worship. And Omega, we worship.
Father, you would help us, Lord God, when this pride rises up in us to recognize it, to humble ourselves, to keep our eyes focused on you and our hearts humbled in worship, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for the incredible life-giving lessons all through your word. Your word is living, true, actively, still, powerful, but sharper than a two-edged sword. Holy Spirit, would you help us as we move forward that we can glorify you, be closer to you, and be effective in what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, God bless you. We love you. If you need prayer for anything, we'll be down here to pray with you. If not, God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, worship team.